Thanks for the invite. Um, so um, I'm not I'm not a theory guy at all. So um, I, I thought what we'd do is so we, my my lab is starting to use some computation and and modeling really for the first time. So it's exciting to be able to talk to all of you. And so what I thought I would do as the non theoretician biologist, I would introduce uh, some of the core biological concepts talk about an early mathematical model that has really stood the test of time for understanding sleep, and then hand it over to uh, Abhilash here, who has really spearheaded the uh, the computational and uh, mathematical approach to sleep in our in our system. So um, so we're going to talk about sleep today. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Can you press about it. I, I can't. Oh, yes. No, maybe I just hit. It won't let me select it. Let me stop. Just, um, it's not showing up online, but it's just. I can't actually do anything here. Let me end the show. Got it. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about sleep um, and how it's regulated. And before we get into you know how we're how we're investigating how the brain actually controls it, so I'm I'm starting with my favorite data set of all time, uh, which represents about a month in the life of a likely a German undergraduate um, who was uh, basically fitted with a rectal thermometer and then forced to live in complete isolation for a month. Um, and what's interesting is the, the, the little um, apartment where this student was forced to live um, was fitted with um, seismometers on the floorboards. So whenever the student was walking around, you get these upward deflections here. The bed also had motion detectors. So bed movements are registered um, on, on below like this. Uh, many of these experiments actually fe fe uh, featured EEG recording. So the students would actually put the electrodes on their heads before they got into bed at night. And so you actually have a physiological indication of when that student was sleeping every day. Um, and what you see here is pretty familiar to all of us that life unfolds with a pretty predictable ry uh, rhythm most of the time. We tend to be doing the same thing at the same time each day. Um, and not only do we oscillate between sleep and wakefulness, but we have a very, very clear physiological uh, rhythm and, and core body temperature. Um, so again, not surprising. What's surprising about these, these data um, is that the student was actually living deep underground in the so-called index bunkers in Germany and was completely isolated from any cues from any sort of temporal cues. So they had no idea when the sun was up, when the sun was down, what time it was on the surface of the planet. Um, and if you look at the x-axis here, time has got these strange units called objective days. And that's because if you take any sort of reliable phase marker, like the peak of body um, body temperature or the midpoint of sleep, for example, that student's day um, was actually closer to like a day on Mars than it is to a solar day on Earth. The student had a average, what we call an endogenous day of almost 26 hours per cycle. So the student actually lost several, I think a couple of days, two or three days, compared to so drifting slowly out of phase with um, with life on the surface of the planet. And so that tells us something really important about our sleep-wake cycles. Um, and that's, they're not driven by a rhythmic environment. You can imagine that it's kind of hard to believe that on a, on, a, on a rotating planet, we would need to have an endogenous day, but we do, right? And so that the human clock controls sleep and it's precise, but inaccurate. It, it, it is nearly 24 hours. Right. Um, and actually, the best estimates now under better lighting conditions is that the human clock runs about 15 minutes slow per day. Um, and so that means that the rhythms that we show are not a passive response to a rhythmic environment, but are endogenous. But that the 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 discrepancy of the endogenous period um, from the 24 hour solar day means that that clock has to be reset every single day. Um, and so the take home message here is that when things happen um, are a product of two fundamental things, this endogenous clock and the way that this clock is reset every day by environmental time cues. So those, that's really what determines when things happen. 
you know, 15 minutes, though, is a lot different than 25.8 mm -hmm. hours. Yeah, and so we think the reason for that is the students in that experiment could control the lighting conditions. And so they, because their clock was already slow, and that they can control when they turn the lights on and off, there was this interesting interaction between their slow clock and their clock's control of their lighting environment. Uh -huh. So now we have better ways of doing this clinically, um, where the, 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 the subject doesn't have control of the lights. And in that case, it's much, it's much more reasonable. It's about 15 minutes off. And you find that, uh, good morning, you find that there's, the, there's a species specific deviation from 24 hours. So the fruit flies that we talk about today are usually, they run fast, like 20, 20 minutes fast or something. But this is something you see over and over and over again. You see an endogenous rhythm that's, that's precise but inaccurate, and it needs to be reset every day. And, you know, sleep is not the only thing that cycles. Really, I think something like 80% of the genes in a mammalian genome somewhere um, are up and down regulated in some tissue system uh, by the circadian clock. So we're talking about this massive, massive daily changes in hormones, gene expression, uh, lots of physiological changes. Uh, your liver is cycling every day to prepare for when you should be feasting and when you should be fasting. Um, and so just to say that, that the, this, this endogenous clock is, is controlling a lot more than just your sleep-wake cycle. It's controlling most aspects of our daily life. Um, Sorry. Oh, please. You, you don't mind if I ask. No, not at all, please. Okay. So you said it's different for different species and the fruit fly and humans are pretty different animals, but they're, no, they're not so different. Well, but, then, <laughs> but it's still around 24. Are there any, any species that have like a six hour circadian clock or? That, so, that so one of the defining, just, it, just, to, just to be, so it, that wouldn't be considered a, a circadian rhythm simply because it's not near 24. Oh, hours. circadian means almost. Yeah, but there are ultradian, Lots of ultradian. Actually, we're going to talk about some ultradian rhythms today in sleep when we start to mess with the system. But there are ultradian rhythms, um, and so you find rhythms on on every time scale. I see. Yeah. I yeah. Like, uh, down, What's that? Lines. Yes. Yep. Yeah, like mosquitoes. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> they they active around the crepuscule. Um, so now, uh, so. Not only do species, obviously, they have their sort of species specific free running period. Um, but if we look at like, if we look at humans, as, as you all probably just know by knowing other humans, is that there's also significant variation in, in human populations. And, you know, pe some people are very clearly morning people, some people are clearly not morning people. Um, and we refer to, you know, you know, the hardcore chronobiologists would talk about the phase angle of entrainment, like when something happens in the context of a 24 hour, a forced 24 hour cycle. Um, but there's wide, there's a wide distribution in what we call human chronotype. Um, so for example, so talking about Till Ronenberg here, um, we were talking about Till before, before we started. Um, he's really sort of found that, um, one of the best ways to sample chronotype from large, large numbers of people is to simply have them do a sleep journal and to figure out when their typical midpoint of sleep is every day. So this, 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 this chronotype, this midpoint of sleep on a, it's called midpoint of sleep on a free day, a day when you don't have to get up and do anything, usually on the weekend, when you're free to do whatever you want, at what point, usually for most of us at night, represents the midpoint of that bout of sleep. And what you see, so this is this is 2 a.m., 4 a.m., 6 a.m., there's a pretty wide distribution of when that happens. It's pretty consistent distribution in, you know, this is a, a sample involving 35,000 people. This is a sample of 501 people. You see a pretty wide distribution there um, of, of chronotype when our midpoint of sleep is. And what's interesting is if you look at um, average chronotype and average sleep duration, you begin to wonder who calls the shots here. So the average chronotype is about 4.30. So that's when the average person on a free day is halfway through their nightly bout of sleep. The average sleep duration, as you all know by now, is around eight hours when, you, when people have the freedom to not to put an alarm clock on. But the average work time, uh, work start time is, uh, is before 8 a.m. Um, and so if you just kind of do a, do a, you know, a quick 
here, this is about all the math I'm capable of. So <laughs> if you just kind of look at what the average chronotype and average sleep duration says is that most of us, for, for the majority of people, uh, or sorry, the average uh, person, the, the free day sleep actually doesn't start until 12.30 a.m. and wouldn't end until 8.30, you know, in 35 minutes, till 35 minutes after we're supposed to be awake and at work and ready to be productive. And so there's, there's a clear, uh, in the modern world, there's a clear pro conflict between what we would naturally do on a free day. This is average. There's lots of people for whom this is, it's even worse to have a normal job. Um, so that, that's, that suggests that there's a conflict. And so um, when all of this work was started, uh, Till and his, his colleagues noticed when they were tracking people's sleep, um, that very, very, very frequently you would see this five, five to two uh, pattern uh, of during the week, you would have relatively short bouts of sleep that were clearly truncated artificially, um, probably by an alarm clock. And then on the weekends, when, when, when people were free to actually sort of just do what felt natural, things were very, very delayed that you would stay up much, much later because you didn't have to get up super early in the morning. And, and then what would happen is you would sleep much longer and typically much later um, into the day uh, on a free day. And so if you look, so as Till suggested, one of the best indicators of what time it is in someone's brain is the midpoint of sleep. If you look at what's happening on a weekly basis to most people, um, you see that there's what he called social jet lag that we tend to do everything earlier. We can sort of force things to happen earlier um, in the day and in the cycle, we're forced to wake up earlier. And that results in a phase in a phase shift that's basically like for, for the average person, a couple of hours of, of jet lag once a week, which you know how you feel when you're jet lagged. Um, and that's what that was called social jet lag. And you can see that uh, if you look at the chronotype on the x-axis here and you compare uh, sleep duration um, on work days in black here and free days in black, that you get these largest, these largest swings in sleep duration the later your chronotype is. So the later your natural chronotype is, the more you get hit with this social, you know, this um, this uh, social jet lag, basically. And a long story short, uh, the worse your the worse your your social jet lag is, the more likely you are to not only um, uh, you know, look to chemicals to wake up in the morning and calm down at night. Um, but there's just, the list just actually keeps growing and growing and growing. You're more likely to be diabetic. You're more likely to get cancer. You're more likely to be depressed. Um, so there's a very, very clear relationship between your chronotype, right? So understanding those two things that I talked about, uh, the, the internal clock and the way that clock is reset every day is really important because the vast majority of us are suffering from some level of social jet lag. And um, it's bad news. It's Most just super bad. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> actually, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's actually it's double edged sword because as you'll see, because of the clock component, your one of the things your clock is doing, as you'll see, is after you've been awake for a very very long time, your clock is there to make sure you put off sleeping mm -hmm. until the proper time. So if your clock is late, even though you're like, oh, you know what, it's seven and a half hours before I have to get up. Your clock is saying, no, it's not time to go to bed yet. And so you resort to depressants at night and stimulants in the morning. Um, what could go wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So, in the, so what, basically what's happened here is that there's been a fundamental change in, in, our, in our world that has produced this. And under ancestral conditions, so I mean, like it wasn't until 1950 that half of the United States was electrified. So as late as 1950, half of the United States had no electric light. And in those days, for the vast majority of people, the day was very bright, the night was very dark, and we had very stable sleep cycles throughout the entire week. This social jet lag doesn't really happen if you don't have artificial light. We spend a lot less time outside. Like this seems bright now because our, well, not really, this is a GC, nothing seems bright, but, but uh, even you know, in a, in a fairly, brightly lit cubicle, that is orders of magnitude lower light intensity than a gloomy day, right? So even a very cloudy day, you're getting a lot more light outside than you do inside. And so 
what's happened is not only has our have our days become dimmer, our nights are are are, are brighter, right? We have cheap electric light, very cheap electric light now. We have screens that we're constantly looking at. And so basically the amplitude of that, the major signal that resets the clock, which is the late dark cycle, has become a lot less reliable. It's become lower in amplitude and a lot less reliable. Because again, it's a bit like that, that German graduate student, we can actually control our light instead of it forcing. So basically before there were two clocks, right? There was this, there was a central oscillator, the central circadian clock, precise but inaccurate. And then there was the sun clock. And there was a very straightforward way of resetting that internal clock um, based on the, the solar clock every single day. That happened, no problem. And you have, we had very nice, stable sleep cycles where we got sufficient sleep every night. But now, we the sun clock has become very, very weak. We still have that same old biological clock that we always have. And now we've got a social clock that's forcing us to, to put an end prematurely to that, to that night of sleep forcing social jet lag and this sort of two on five off or five on one, two off uh, social jet lag is causing a lot of problems. And so understanding the neural basis of both that, so just uh, I'll show you all of this is happening in the brain. I'm a neuroscientist and, and, and I'm fascinated by how the brain ha creates this endogenous rhythm and then how that endogenous rhythm through neural pathways is reset every day. And we have to understand this if we wanna understand uh, what our modern environments are doing to our, our sleep and our health. Okay, so actually chronobiology is a field that it has attracted a lot of theorists, a lot of theorists. Um, and I'm coming from, I'm coming from the field in, in a, in a I wouldn't say kind of unaware, blissfully unaware of most theoretical <laughs> uh, approaches to it. Because, my, because of my chose, chosen model organism. So uh, you may wonder why on earth we're gonna talk about fly sleep. Um, and as it turns out, this, this beautiful creature here has just been an absolute juggernaut in life sciences, precisely because it allows someone like me <laughs> with no real theoretical skill to actually make tremendous headway in understanding biological mechanisms. And the main tool that we, that we used, so just to give you a little bit of context, the fly was first used, the first Nobel Prize for work in the flies was awarded in around 1914, T.H. Morgan. He used the fly to show that genes are on chromosomes. So before Morgan, and before Morgan used the fly, it was the fundamental mystery in biology was how genes were inherited. We already knew about Mendel and that there was some information that was being passed you know, from one generation to the next, it had a physical basis. He was the first to really prove uh, experimentally that whatever that information was it, was, it was going from one generation to the next on chromosomes. And the, the fundamental tool that biologists began to use, and it didn't matter if you were interested in how things develop, how patterns form from no patterns, um, uh, how uh, metabolic systems work, how the brain works, the idea was very, very simple. You would take hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of flies that were genetically identical, and you would feed them a chemical that they knew would cause single letter changes in DNA. They had it to the point where you could feed, you could put, you could put food, uh, poison in the food, uh, um, mutagen in the food, and you could know with certainty that that dose of that mutagen would either have no effect or cause one what we call nucleotide or one letter change in the DNA. And you would do that to thousands and thousands of flies um, and you would find some way of screening for mutants. So, so some flies that had been mutagenized that had some problem in whatever process you were interested in. And for, for many, many years, this was development. You would, you would mutagenize flies, you would look for flies that looked strange, maybe had, had feet coming out where antennae should be. Um, that, that, that kind of discovery led to the discovery of patterning genes that pattern our spinal cord. And, um, and so, uh, but a real breakthrough happened when a guy named Seymour Benzer at uh, Caltech said, well, if you can do this for development, you should be able to do it for behavior. So he was actually instrumental in the birth of molecular biology, but switched his focus. You know, once the genetic code had been solved and all that, a lot of these guys became very interested in, in brains. And he reckoned, well, if you could do a forward genetic screen for development, 
you can do a forward genetic screen for behavior. And so Ron Kanapka, his first graduate student at the time uh, at Caltech said, well, I, you know what? I'm fascinated by circadian clocks. I'm gonna do a, a forward genetic screen and look for flies that have problems keeping time. Um, and so what I'm showing here is a wild type fly. The way that we actually keep, this is the, this is the fly equivalent of the German bunker experiment here. We've got a single fruit fly. We've got media that uh, the fly can eat for weeks at a time. Uh, and those are you know, closed up one end with, with yarn or cotton. This is just a plastic plug. And so we shoot infrared beams across hundreds of these tubes. And so you can keep track of when each of these flies are awake and when they're not. And so these are activity profiles under constant darkness and constant temperature. So the fly has no clue as to what, it, it, what time it is in the real world. And so in a real amazing uh, uh, set of results, uh, Kanapka found a series of mutants. So this is what he called period zero mutants. So in contrast to the wild type fly, the normal fly where you see, you see lots of activity, lower activity, going back and forth cycle after cycle, per zero one basically had no idea what time it was. It couldn't mount an endogenous rhythm and activity. Uh, but you know, if that had been the only thing that he found, it probably, it would have been important, but it wouldn't have been as earth shattering as the fact that he found two more mutants. So he found a mutant that he called period short that had very fast running clocks. So it's almost as if it had been wound up too tight. So instead of like a near 24 hour rhythm here, the free running period was about 20 hours. And then he found per long, which had, it was a bit like the, the, the German bunker, but this time under constant darkness and constant temperature had very long rhythms. Um, and remarkably, they were able to, one of the things that you can do in flies at the time is you can ask, okay, where the, the fly only has four, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, the fly only has four pairs of chromosomes, you could say, oh, what chromosome is this on, and what part of that chromosome what, is it on, and remarkably, all three of these mutations had landed in exactly the same spot on the same chromosome, suggesting that they were just three different versions of the same gene. And that led to uh, a remarkable set of biochemical experiments that basically showed uh, that there's a really simple cellular mechanism at the heart of this. So this is, a, this is per period, this is the period gene. And in flies, basically what happens is period is expressed every single day with a rhythm. It gets translated from DNA into RNA, the RNA turns into protein. And when per builds up, it enters the nucleus and shuts itself off every day. So it's a negative, it's a negative feedback loop. It's expressed, it builds up, it goes into the nucleus, it shuts itself off. And that happens with a near 24 hour rhythm normally. If you speed up that molecular clock, you speed up the sleep, sleep activity cycle. And luckily for uh, the people who did this work, it was found that the human and mouse and mam the mammalian clock runs on the same gene. It runs on a period gene. There are three versions of that gene in our genome, but it does exactly the same thing. It builds up every day, feeds back on its own production, shuts itself off, disappears, and this just happens over and over and over again. And that discovery led to the Nobel Prize in 2017. These are the three uh, characters that led the work. And you know, not only is it an elegant mechanism, but I think they, they really benefited from the fact that subsequent work showed that the clock runs exactly the same way in all animals. And there's, that's a pretty big gap from 71 to 2017. Lots of missteps along the way. And, and, and they had to discover all these other components using the same random forward genetic screen, figure out what the genes were, how they interact with one another. You know, So it, it took a long time, many PhD theses, many broken hearts. Yeah. And long story short, um, these molecular clocks are expressed everywhere. In your body, but are are required in very small islands of brain tissue in order to have the kinds of rhythms we talked about: body temperature rhythms, sleep activity rhythms. That your clock rests right above the roof of your mouth. Your optic nerves come in from your retina. They cross before they come in, and right above that, what we call chiasm, are, is the, are the suprachiasmatic nuclei of the hypothalamus. There's about twenty thousand neurons in each side, and those uh, that's if you take away that little tiny, tiny, tiny part of the brain, you get rid of uh, circadian rhythms, even though there's clocks cycling over the over everything. Um, now, 
here, that 20,000 neurons per hemisphere, neurons can form hundreds and hundreds of connections. The network properties of these tiny little islands of brain tissue are incredibly complicated. And here the fly helps us again. So instead of 20,000 neurons in each uh, set, so there's really two clocks, there's a right clock and a left clock, the right clock and left clock of the fly has 75 neurons, right? So one copy of period instead of three copies of period, 75 neurons instead of 20,000. So it's a, it's a wonderful place to work as a neuroscientist because it's simpler. And I, I'm going, I wanna make sure Abolash has enough time here. I basically spent 20 years of my life figuring out how this network of 150 neurons, 75 in each half of the brain, you know, how they, how they talk to one another, how they create an endogenous sense of time, how they bring in sensory inputs to reset the clock every day. We've made a lot of progress understanding that. Um, and the idea is because these things are so highly conserved that, that the things we, with the things we learn in a simpler brain are almost always directly relevant to what's going on in our own. So that gets us to sleep. I'm gonna hand it off real quick. So I wanna talk, talk a little bit, I told you what a circadian rhythm is, but I wanna say a little bit about what sleep is. So sleep is, is associated with a drastically reduced physical activity and an elevated arousal threshold. So you stop moving and it, and, and it takes a lot more of a stimulus to get you to move again, right? So, you know, a, a noise, you're much, I'm much more, if I hear a strange noise, I'm much more likely to move and attend to it. If I'm asleep, that, that, that noise has to be much, much louder, much more intense. It's rapidly reversible. So this, con this is how we contrast sleep from something like coma. Right. So when I do fall asleep, I can respond to the fire alarm. It takes me longer. It needs to be louder, but it does it. And a fundamental aspect of, of sleep is that it's homeostatically controlled. That if you prevent an animal or a, a person um, from sleeping and then uh, you give them the opportunity to sleep again, they will sleep more. So the longer you're awake, the stronger your drive to sleep. And if deprived of sleep in subsequent cycles, you will sleep more. You have to sort of pay back the sleep debt. And this is why social jet lag happens, right? We're sleep deprived throughout the week. We owe, like we have a sleep debt that we need to repay. We need to repay. That's homeostatic control. Um, and this is happening throughout the course of the day. That as we're awake longer and longer and longer, the drive to sleep becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. That's that homeostat is engaged every single day uh, when we're awake. And so to prepare for Abolash's new work, I wanted to talk about a, a, a quantitative model of sleep that's been around for a very, very long time and has really captured human sleep remarkably well. And the idea is that what controls when and how much we sleep is really the product of two fairly independent, you're gonna see that they're not completely independent, but two fairly independent processes, a sleep homeostat and a circadian clock. And the idea is this, that um, when we talk about the daily buildup of sleep pressure, right? You have, when you're awake, this process S builds up. And this is actually hypothesized to be mediated by, mo by molecules. That, that there's, there, there are old experiments where you take a sleep deprived animal, you take the blood out of the sleep deprived animal or the cerebral spinal fluid of a sleep deprived animal, you inject it into a well-rested animal and it makes that animal sleepy. So the idea is, is that as, you, as we're awake, sleepiness is building up because of this process S probably mediated by some substance S or substances S and that's building as up yet undetected. as yet completely as yet unknown. Uh, Huberman would say it's adenosine, but he's a hack. Um, <laughs> all right. So, so it's going to rise up every single day up to some point when we fall asleep. And as we fall asleep, we get, we get a, we get a, 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 a fall in the level of that process. And so the idea is, is that upon reaching some upper threshold, some sleep threshold, that, that concentration of S trips something in our brain and that induces sleep. And then as we sleep, process S falls until it hits a lower threshold, at which point we, translate, we, tra we transition from sleep to wakefulness is the idea. Okay, but I just said there's two processes, right? And so what we know is, is that this doesn't completely account for human sleep. So if we deprive a human being of sleep, and they used to do really long experiments, I don't know how they got away with it. Keep a, keep a guy awake for six days, and then you let them go back to sleep, right? 
there are days uh, of day, there are times on day five of sleep deprivation where that person is less likely to fall asleep than they were at other times the day before, even though they've got more sleep debt, there are times of the day when it's much, much harder to fall asleep, right? So how did, how did he account for that? Uh, this is what I'm showing here. So this is basically uh, self-reported fatigue over uh, 72 hour sleep deprivation. We're more and more or less alert throughout the day of three days of sleep deprivation, right? And there must be something, uh, there must be something controlling that. And the idea here is that those thresholds, those upper and lower thresholds must be changing, right? And so when you put these two things together, it really explains a lot about how we behave. So for example, you're a late chronotype, right? You know you've got to get to bed by, by 10 o'clock at night if you want your eight hours of sleep to be at work at time. But your threshold, your upper threshold is super high. So even though you've built up a lot of sleep pressure, you can't fall asleep, right? And as it turns out, that, that this makes really beautiful quantitative predictions about human sleep, both under normal sleep-wake cycles and, um, and in, in the context of sleep deprivation. It makes very, very strong quantitative predictions about the amount and the timing of sleep in humans. So just to make sure I understand, the curves there are the, actually the changing upper thresholds that you were talking yep. about and the changing lower thresholds. Yes. Okay. Yep. And the idea is that's what that circadian clock is doing somewhere. Nobody really knows how. That's what we're going to try to use the fly to figure out. And so the, so the thing about this, I just told you about all these wonderful tools to use in the fly brain, but actually neuroscientists who study sleep in the brain, both in the fly and in uh, mammalian model systems like mice and rats, it's been completely unmoored from this quantitative model. And as somebody who's never really used a quantitative model before, having his expertise, Abhilash's expertise, I'm going to hand it over to him now, we decided, okay, what would it be like to have a quantitative model? of sleep based on this well-established um, two process model and use that it, for me as an experimentalist, how do I use that to make quantitative predictions of what specific sets of neurons are doing? Um, and so um, actually I'll hand it over to you now. So the idea is how do we begin to explore how the fly brain, uh, I've only showed you the circadian clock part of this, but there are other neurons that we know are involved in sleep control. How, how can we use the, a two process model uh, as a framework, as a foundation for our experimentation? And so we're going to, uh, Abhilash is going to take over now and tell you about how he's created a, a quantitative two process model for flies and, um, and then how we're using it to understand fly sleep. Okay, so. Thanks, Ari, for that background. Thank you all for having me here. It's um, it's super fun actually to talk to um, quantitative people about this because because um, he has no one to talk to. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's a, there's a there's a there's a, a mix, but there are definitely people here that know something about dynamics. You know? Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, more, <laughs> more more than me for sure because I'm not I'm not formally trained in math or in computation so all of this is well you didn't tell me that when you applied in your lab yeah <laughs> i tricked you so uh, so yeah so what i'm going to do right now is like Ori said um so the idea is so we have this model that kind of works really well for humans and we have a model of the fly brain and we know what these 75 neurons in the brain actually does to activity and sleep the ultimate goal in some sense is to figure out which of these neurons, if at all, contribute to these oscillating upper and lower thresholds and whether these neurons actually have something to do with process S, which is kind of keeping track of how long you've been awake and when uh, what, uh, what happens when you go to sleep. Uh, so before I tell you a little bit about the model, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Drosophila sleep. So like Ari said, you have this small uh, tube in which you have a single fly and Every time the fly cuts the beam, the IR beam is recorded as activity. And people have shown that uh, if there is five continuous minutes of inactivity or longer, the fly shows these characteristics of sleep, like increased arousal threshold and other things. So we, as a field, have accepted that any duration of inactivity that is longer than five minutes can be considered as a single bout of sleep in fly. Um, and when you look at sleep, in this plot over here, uh, 
where you have on the x-axis, you have time. So you have four LD cycles. The gray shaded region is the dark phase, 12 hours of dark phase of a 24 hour day. And the unshaded region is the daytime. And on the y-axis, you have sleep per 30 minutes. You can see that flies actually sleep a lot. And the three traces here are three different, so to speak, genetic background strains and control strains. And what you can see is flies actually have two episodes of organized bouts of sleep, one during the day, one during the night. And uh, they actually sleep a lot. Also, I remember I told you that flies are crepuscular. So you will see that there are two bouts of activity just like um, um, on the, like every time there is a dip in sleep is when there is activity. So you have these activity that coincide with dawn and dusk. So you have this crepuscular activity pattern. And this is also kind of similar to human sleep because a lot of human societies uh, have this behavior of napping in the afternoon. So you have these two episodes of uh, sleep in a 24 hour day. Sorry, just to make sure I'm seeing this right. So the dip is just before um, darkness and just after. That's right. So during dawn and dusk. So if you're catching something important that there's a lot more anticipation at night. So they're waking up much in anticipation of dusk, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of direct startle associated with the activity right. of the day. That's the that's the effect of light too. Yeah. Um, so what you see here is just the amount of percentage of time spent sleeping, and all these strains sleep anywhere between about 70 to 80 percent of a 24 hour day. You sleep a lot. Um, <laughs> so I I will I will come back to these metrics in a little bit. So what we have is a fly system which does sleep, and we can estimate the timing of sleep and the amount of sleep. And we're going to make use of that in the context of the two process model. Yeah. So the colors are different in the uh, Which one of those is just now? Better? These are not mutations. All three are different background strains. They're all control strains. Well, although, so the W1118 is the first mutant that was ever described for flies as a white eyed fly. Mm -hmm. The fly's eyes are usually red. And, and yellow the, white has two, two, a yellow mutation that makes its cuticle yellow. And it has that white. White. Gene. There's are commonly used genetic backgrounds for genetics experiments in flies. But, but can't an ask a period. No, these no, are not the yet. period mutants. Cantoness is sort of the closest thing to a normal fly. A wild yeah. type fly. Cantoness was, yeah, it was caught in the wild at some point, and it's been <laughs> and it's been in the lab for many, many, many generations now. Uh, but yeah, so W and W triple one eight and yellow white are mutants in the sense that there are mutants that regulate eye color and body color and stuff like that. But all the mutants that people make and build transgenic flies that people build are on these backgrounds, like a W background, a yellow white background. So these are typically just used as a background control in some sense. So, yeah. Okay, so which actually brings me to this model. So what I have done is I've basically replotted the model. This is uh, replotted from the first paper in 1984, which describes the math behind the model. So we have the upper and lower thresholds, which are uh, simply defined as a sinusoidal wave, where um, the mu is the mean level around which this oscillation happens, um, and A is the amplitude of that oscillation, and omega is the frequency. So the omega is kind of held at about 24 hours, because we think these are circadian oscillations, and under LD cycles, they will have an exact 24-hour period. Um, the same thing, uh, the same form of equation for the lower threshold, but the only way in which the upper and lower thresholds differ in the model is in the mean level around which the oscillation happens, which is mu u and mu l. It's fairly straightforward, and uh, the original model modeled them as sinusoidal oscillations and without a phase difference between the upper and lower thresholds, that the peak at the same time and the uh, trough is at the same time. Um, and the Sleep pressure, which is the red line over here, is modeled uh, using two equations, both of which are exponential functions. So the upper, uh, the rising phase is modeled as uh, one minus i uh, times one minus s at a previous time window. These are all recursive equations. So the reason we have the the form of this equation is in this uh, fashion because we want to restrict s between zero and one. It's just to non-parameterize the whole uh, model. Um, and that's how it was um, built in the beginning. So that's what we've stuck with. And uh, the falling phase is a much simpler equation where it's just uh, S at a particular time is uh, delta times S at a previous time where delta is uh, determining the rate at which the threshold, uh, the sleep process falls, the sleep pressure falls. Is it right. that delta will 
be roughly constant for people over time, or is there a parameter that might? So that's the thing. We don't know. Uh, but I will come to um, this part in my talk where um, I will show you that even across flies with different genotypes, we think that delta might be different. So the amount of sleep and the stability of sleep rhythms are heavily dependent on I and delta, which is what we're going to come, I mean, we're going to come to in a little bit, which is interesting because such experiments are not possible to do with humans. So the thing is, I can generate a bunch of flies which have different internal times. I can plug those values into the model and I can ask if the model predicts such unstable rhythms. And if it does, uh, to what extent does it actually match experimental results? And if it doesn't, how can I change the model to explain mathematical uh, uh, the experimental results, which will then tell me how I and delta are dependent on parameters of the circadian clock, which is something you can't do with humans or mammals, mouse in general. I guess, I guess for mammals, you, you would hope that if you discover the molecular agent, yeah. then you could measure that and get a model for F. That's correct. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, yeah. But you, this, the problem, so the thing is, you can't do experiments at the scale at which you can do with flies and the amount of variation that you can generate in flies and the speed at which you can generate that variation, I mean, it's just unparalleled. You can't do that with humans or mice or any other mammalian system. The advantage is if you figure out what's happening in the fly, you can go back and check if that is actually what's happening in humans or mice because it's something that you can easily sample which is kind of the utility of using the fly system. Um, but I will come to that. So actually, yeah, the story is get, going to get more interesting and the role of I and Delta will become clearer in some sense. This, this would also be like crazy chaotic, right? If A and Omega change from upper and lower. That, that's true. Yeah. We So the thing is, if, if the circuit is working uh, as it should, as a network, I don't think omega between the upper and lower thresholds will change. They will, as a network property, the periodicity of the system should be similar. But it is true that A can be different. It is also true that the phase relationship between the upper and lower thresholds can be different. And that's like a completely tangential aspect to what we're trying to get at, but it's something that I am really interested in. So at some point we will have to do those things. Also, the other thing is we don't know uh, biologically what these upper and lower thresholds are. So we don't know to what extent the amplitudes will be different or the phase relationship will be different. So as we kind of uh, try to get at uh, these bits and pieces and figure out what these are, then there'll be more reason to believe that the amplitudes might be different or the phases might be different and things like that. So yeah, a lot of things to do basically. Mm -hmm. um, and then the wonderful thing is we could just plug that in and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, basically. I, Which has been yeah. amazing. I'm, I'm getting that sense that flies are fun for this reason. Well, no, I mean, oh, for me, just... never even having a model. So he made me a GUI where I can just say, okay, let's change the phase. Let's change the altitude. I... Let's change the mean values. And you can see what the model mm -hmm. says a fly should do, which has been really fun. I, yeah, yeah, I'll show you. I mean, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, so this is basically our starting point. So these are, uh, so the form of these equations are not something that I came up with. It's the form that was proposed before. For what, me. yeah. What we are going to do, and so this is something I don't think we mentioned before. So in humans, the values of I and delta are really based on uh, the EEG data that people have from humans, which kind of uh, look at deep sleep. So you have EEG, uh, the power of EEG um, in the deep sleep zone, and they see how that builds with sleep deprivation. And then once you sleep after sleep deprivation, how that power falls. Mm -hmm. So based on that, the I and delta are kind of parameterized, but in the fly, we don't have something like that. So we just have to do like a sum of squared difference kind of best fitting kind of system and figure out what explains sleep the best. And, and also the human has like one sleep per day. Mostly. Like yeah. Like fly more. Yeah. It's interesting though, about 50% of humans tested in the lab have two peaks of increased sleep propensity. So about half of, half of human beings are like lost. Yeah. And this is if you if you if you get a really bad slump around three or four in the afternoon, you're probably one of these people um, that have an increased sleep capacity. Yeah, that's me. I'm surprised it's not all or not. We're <laughs> at yeah, it's really weird. It yeah. is. Well, you know, you need you need some people to stay awake and make sure that the your your group doesn't get eaten by a predator or something. You know, I think there's probably evolutionarily some advantage to having different chronotypes and different. Yeah. 
I mean, there have been papers that have hypothesized that. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So now I have this form and uh, what we did was um, play around with this, but before that, I'm gonna just show you uh, something um, kind of which is slightly uh, tangential to the main point. So we have Canton S and W1118 here, which are plotted in the form of what we call somnograms. So each row over here is a single day. And um, on the X axis, you have time. And what is being plotted um, is the sleep. And the gray shaded area is again, the dark phase. And you can see that sleep happens in two bouts, right? So this is something that, it, there's a new pipeline for analyzing sleep, which, uh, is, which is something that I built in the lab. And people have not visualized sleep, just half a sleep in this way. And uh, the point of me showing you this is to show you that when you do time series analysis um, and look at uh, predominant periodic components in your data uh, using sleep time series, not locomotor activity, which people have always done, you actually see that there are two very strong peaks, one at 12 hours and one at 24 hours, which is not surprising because you have sleep that's happening in two bouts like every 12 hours, right? Um, the big advantage of this is that when I make predictions from the simulations from the model, I can run time series analysis and actually just look for uh, two peaks, which one that's at 12 and one that's at 24 to identify uh, this bimodal aspect of sleep. Um, and like I showed you, a percentage of sleep, a time spent sleeping over 24 hours is anywhere between 70 to 80% for these two, uh, for all these three strains. And what I now do, is fix the um, parameter values of the upper and lower thresholds uh, as being the exact same, but uh, just the mean value of the upper and lower threshold being different. And I generate a series of I and delta values, right? And what you see here on the left is the parameter space on the x-axis you have the um, increase of sleep pressure, which is I, and on the y-axis, you have the decay of sleep pressure, which is delta. And you'll see that a big area of this parameter space is yellow, which means that there are complex rhythms. What that means is you have more than three periodic components in your predicted data set, which is very unlike fly sleep. You'll also see that a large portion of this parameter space is white, which basically means that there is no circadian rhythmicity in sleep at all. And then there's a very small subset which has unimodal sleep. You have only one episode of sleep per cycle and another small region which has bimodal sleep. So what we're interested in is in bimodal sleep because flies have bimodal sleep, right? So we then look at the bimodal set on the right side. And what we find is uh, the parameter combination of I and delta that gives me the minimum difference between uh, the amount of sleep in the model predicted by the model and the three strains of flies that we're using, which you see over here, right? And those parameter values are now used to build uh, a fly to process model, which looks like that. So the I and delta parameter values gives you something like that, where you have two episodes of sleep, you have a smaller daytime episode of sleep and a longer nighttime episode of sleep. And this model predicts that flies will sleep about 80% of the time, which I think is a reasonably good starting place to play around with the model. So once I had this, I actually, like Ari said, I built a GUI. So we have this GUI for uh, for the model where you can just plug in values and change the phase relationship between these uh, upper and lower thresholds or the amplitudes and just see, visualize what happens to sleep rhythms uh, for people who are not very comfortable with programming, which is like a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and then do I understand correctly like the the, the periods, for the um, and, and the amplitudes for for, for the curves, um, you you have a good idea of, of what those are from so for this other other kinds of biological. So the thing is, for this model, the period is held at twenty four hours because we're doing an LD cycle with twelve hours of light, twelve hours of darkness. Mm -hmm. So the environmental cycle is exactly twenty four hours. So your internal behavior has to be exactly twenty four hours, which is fairly well known. And established. So the period has been set for both the thresholds at exactly 24. The amplitudes have been just, uh, I've, we've just taken the value from the 1984 paper, which seems to suggest that that's the amplitude of the oscillation, but we haven't played around with that. Um, yeah, go ahead. Other than that, there is really nothing 
more to change in yeah. in the parameter set. Have you played with uh, like light from dark time elements like the Say that again. I'm not sure I quite understand. Like twelve hours is like twelve hours of dark. This makes sense with the control, but like it's five to ten hours. Oh yeah. So we have experiments where we do that, but I haven't used that to start building the model. But I can actually do that and see if it holds up. I didn't do that. I haven't done that. So the other sorry, go ahead. The other thing is, um, we started building this model under an LD cycle, but. The goal is to really ask how the S process and the C process kind of influence each other. So we want to do this under environments where there is no light dark cycle, where there's constant darkness. So light doesn't independently influence the S process or the C process or an interaction between the two. So that's why we haven't really built, I mean, played with the model under such conditions where you have eight hour light and 16 hour darkness and things like that. Sorry, go ahead. That's what I was going to say. That we're about ready to take actually a, a step further away from real life and just take away the, the light. Yeah. Completely. Because yeah. we know that light can independently affect process S it's or arousing. process C. It's arousing. And also an interaction of the two. But the idea is to really ask how these two processes influence each other, which is something right. that people have not looked at. I mean, there are indications and suggestions, but we don't really know. And I'll come to why, I mean, the analysis strategy that we use to do this in a little bit, but yeah. And just as a test of, you know, quizzing myself on the previous part. So if you do take away light, then your period is going to be 23 Some, hours, yeah. 40 minutes or whatever. Something yeah. like and as you'll see, we have exquisite control over that genetically in the flies because of all the genetics that have been done. Right. So as you're going to see, Avalosh can push the free running period over a large... About 15 hours. Yeah. Right. Range of hours. Yeah. So that's that's right. So this is basically an example in the GUI of a situation where the circadian clock is running under constant conditions. So 23.5 hours is just some random value I plugged in. It's kind of close to the fly because it's about 23.6. And you can see that every day, the two bouts of sleep actually successively advance, right? Which is true because it's not 20, I mean, which, which is expected because it's not 24 hours. That's, that's the condition which we are going to really play around with. Um, so we wanted to really ask to what extent the two process model explains fly sleep. So the okay. first, go so ahead. I'm sort of assuming that this is like a very unstable picture, like if you change the frame of a tiny amount, like it would get something completely chaotic. It, de it, it depends on which parameter you're talking about. So if I change this uh, period of the oscillations, mm -hmm. then there are certain windows where you will have poorer rhythms. Also, I'll come to that in a Which is a really interesting prediction. prediction. And not one that people again could test in other in other model systems. So this is why this is why I'm so excited about it because I never would have thought I never would have thought that okay we've got flies that can run it. I showed you we got flies that can run at 19 hours and we got flies that can run at 28 hours. I never would have. I just would always assume that there was enough coordination between the clock and the homeostat that you could you could set up a stable sleep rhythm. Mm -hmm. But the model suggests that that may not be true, which I'll see. Yeah. So before I kind of come to that, I want to show you an example of the two process model where we have exactly 24 hours. And you can see that you have, this is what I showed you before. So you have, it takes a few cycles to kind of stabilize, but then you have these two episodes of sleep per cycle. And what we asked first was uh, what happens when you just flatten the thresholds out, like in, in this um, figure that Ori showed you, where you have flat upper and lower thresholds, you will have the sleep pressure build and it hits the upper threshold. And then you kind of um, start releasing the sleep pressure and you hit the lower threshold. And what happens as a consequence is simply very high frequency uh, sleep rhythms, which is about eight to nine, hour, with about eight to nine hour periodicity, which is really a trivial kind of uh, prediction. But what is interesting is that this is not tested in, in any animal system. Like when you have flat thresholds, what happens to sleep rhythms is not something that people have tested. And again, I think it's because of pe people like me, because of the power of their model systems, they're, they have never been working in the context of this formal model. And so they've never they've never said, oh, the model makes this really trivial prediction of the trillion rhythms. Let's see if we can find it. Yeah. So okay. what, how, how do you flatten that experimentally? Uh, so you remember Audi told you about these per period mutations, the period oh, zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the period zero has no circadian clock. So there will be random fluctuations in the level of the threshold, but there is no circadian fluctuation. So in some sense, this threshold is not oscillating in a circadian fashion. It's not going to be exactly straight. 
or like a perfect flat line, but it's flat in terms of a circuit in the circadian sense. There is no circadian oscillation. Right. So you will have a lot of noise, but the thresholds are kind of flat. How, how do you plan the other thresholds? Both, because both of these are regulated by the circadian clock. So a mutation of the molecular circadian clock will render both the thresholds flat. And we're making a we're making an assumption here that whatever happens to the the, the upper one happens to the oh, lower one. Yeah, they're, they're they're oscillating in unison somehow, which may not be which may not be true. But what I think is true is that both of them are regulated by the circadian clock. Mm -hmm. So if the core circadian clock is disrupted, then I'm expecting that both of them will be disrupted. So we actually test that in the fly very easily. So we have, so yeah, so the prediction is that lack of oscillating thresholds must give rise to high frequency sleep rhythms, right? So what you see here is um, a wavelet spectrogram of uh, where we kind of estimate periodicity across the entire duration of the experiment. So on the x-axis you have time. So we have we have uh, examined this fly over 15 days. On the y-axis you have period, it's on a log scale. That's why the dif distance between these numbers are kind of changing. And the color on the heat map tells you uh, the contribution of each of these periodic components. And you can see that over the entire duration of 15 days, you have this strong signal at around 24 hours, which is expected of a wild type fly because you have a 24 hour oscillation. And because bimodal sleep happens, you also see a signal around 12 hours, right? You have a 12 hour signal and a 24 hour signal. This is just one representative fly. And then when you look at the clock mutant period zero one, you can see that all the circadian oscillation and the 12 hour oscillations are gone and you have a lot of signal in the uh, ultradian range anywhere varying between two hours to about six hours. Uh, when you actually look at that across all the flies, you can see here uh, a frequency distribution of all the periodicity that are detected across all the flies. And you can see this tw sharp 12 hour and 24 hour peak in the wild type fly, which is Canton S. And you can see this high concentration of ultradian rhythms in your loss of function clock mutant, which seems to, um, which, which makes sense. It's something that the model predicts is a very straightforward outcome of flattening the thresholds. And it's something that you can also detect experimentally, which means that it's a very useful system now to play around with. But interestingly, qualitatively, it's accurate. But quantitatively, we're not seeing the no. nine hour. You're not seeing the nine hours. Yeah. See, so there are a lot of things that are going on around here, right? We do not know what the distance between these two, two thresholds are. Mm -hmm. So if you kind of reduce the, distance periodicity will change. We don't know the kind of noise that's there in each of these thresholds. So a lot of those things contribute to the actual experimental variation, which we have no handle over. So we can't really estimate that. And we also wouldn't expect S jumping up and down between these that flat thresholds to be like the, the circadian clock is highly adapted to be very reliable from cycle to cycle. You wouldn't expect that of most process, biological processes. No. Yeah. Also, Within an individual, the kind of variation that this S process has is something we don't have access to at the moment. So there are a lot of reasons why quantitatively they may not match, but I think qualitative matching is a big step ahead for sure. Yeah, you, I, I, if you, uh, but you are you are seeing um, in in this picture for the um, for the flattened example. Per zero one, you you are seeing something like around two or three hours. You know, it's yeah. not uniform or something. It's also possible that not only have you flattened them, but you you've brought them closer together somehow. Yeah. So that it's jumping, you know, it's jumping even more frequently between yeah. the two thresholds than you would expect from a functional. Um, what what is also interesting is there are of course a lot. A lot there are at least three other mutants that we have uh, looked at, which also have these loss of function, uh, like they kind of abolish these circadian oscillations in the thresholds. All of those also have this ultradian rhythms in, in sleep, which is I think really cool. Uh, so we do know that these rhythms exist and these probably a more parsimonious explanation is a consequence of the flat threshold and the sleep pressure kind of hitting up and down, like just bouncing back and forth. Yeah. Uh, I think had, something... not, had we not seen this, it would have suggested that this model doesn't play with the flies at all. You know, if we saw if we saw a complete absence of any coherent ultradian yeah. rhythmicity. We would have really suggested that the two process doesn't work. But... Also, I will say that this particular way of analyzing periodicities has been a technical advance in the fly field because nobody uses this kind of a wavelet based method to detect periodicities in flies. It's it's something that people don't use at all. And if we use the traditional time series analysis methods that people have used before, there's no way you would have picked this up. 
Um, uh, yeah, so which actually brings me to this uh, slide where, we, where I'm going to talk to you about further analysis strategy. So what we do is uh, we fix the S process parameters, the I and delta that we got from the best fitting model. And we vary the C process a lot. And we do this. And then based on that, we generate sleep time series for each of these combinations. And we make predictions about stability of sleep rhythms, which is what I'm calling power of sleep rhythms and amount of sleep. Those are the two things that we can experimentally measure. And the reason for doing using this strategy is because we have exquisite control over the C process in the fly, mm -hmm. right? So uh, just to remind you, Ori talked about these four uh, alleles that have this different speeds of the internal clock. And when you, so there is also an additional allele in the same gene called per T, which we don't have here. So when you use all these five alleles and set up crosses between them, you can actually generate a range of periodicities that vary from 15 to about 30 hours. So that's a frequency distribution of number of flies that we have and their respective free running periodicity. So we have this huge range of free running periods. So we can experimentally modify the C process in some sense. And then, but we don't know what the S process is. So that's the analysis strategy. You fix the S, you vary the C, you make predictions, you see how they match with experimental results because that's what you can do experimentally. I don't think you can do this kind of range of free running periods with any other model system. It's not, and at the speed at which we do it. You know, so we do that. And uh, the model actually predicts that there are certain regions of speeds of internal clocks where you have stability of rhythm. So this is just a qualitative uh, assessment of which rhythms are stable and which are unstable. So the green highlighted ones are what we categorize as stable and the red as unstable. I will show you a more quantitative estimate of these. So each of these period, for each of these periodicities, we generate sleep time series and we do this time series analysis. And what we have is something that looks like this. So you have these zones of uh, pre-running periods where stability or power of sleep rhythms is high. And then there are these zones where you have either arrhythmic sleep patterns or very poor um, power. So qualitatively, you can see that, th so that's the same plot that's being replotted over here, which is the prediction from the model. And what we have experimentally is shown here. So what you can see is uh, qualitatively, you can definitely see that there are some windows of uh, clock speeds where you have poorer uh, rhythm stability, but the specific uh, free running period windows where the stability is low is not captured by the model, right? Uh, so just to reiterate, the model actually qualitatively predicts what's going to happen, but quantitatively not so much. We also look at the amount of sleep and what you see here is on the X axis is the running period on the Y axis is the amount of sleep and the red trace is your experimental uh, values and the blue trace, uh, the black trace is the uh, predictions from the model. And you can see that qualitatively it matches. So with increasing free running period, the amount of sleep increases, but it doesn't capture the nuances of this non-monotonic relationship between speed and amount of sleep, which again, goes to show that qualitatively the model makes predictions that oh, by and large kind of match, but quantitatively not so much. So then what we do is we use a slightly um, more elaborate strategy. Uh, we also vary the S process parameters. And for all these S process parameters, for each of the C process parameters, you generate a sleep time series. So, and then remember in the beginning, I was telling you about the best fitting approach. In some sense, we do the same thing here. For each free running period, you do a best fitting approach. And then you see if you can quantitatively match experimental and uh, prediction values. And then you can see that both for the stability of sleep rhythms and for the amount of sleep, you have a remarkably good match between experimental and model values. So then what we can ask is what values of I and delta uh, for which free running period gives you these relationships, uh, which brings me to this plot where you can see that the relationship between free running period and the I and delta values are kind of complex and nonlinear. So on the X axis, you have the speed of the clock. And in the top panel, you have the uh, I or increase of sleep pressure. And on the bottom panel, you have the decay rate or the um, dissipation of sleep pressure. And in both these cases, um, in at least in case of the buildup, you will see that um, 
values between about 17 to 19 hours seem to have a faster buildup. And, uh, but the decay is kind of faster in a different window of free running period, which tells you that um, the relationship between I and the free running period and delta and the free running period are not happening at the same values of free running period. So overall, shorter running clocks or faster running clocks have faster buildup or faster decay of sleep pressure. But it's not always going to be just faster decay or faster build. You know, so a 19 hour clock can have faster buildup of sleep pressure, but a 21 hour clock will probably have faster decay of sleep pressure. So it's not going to happen at the same window, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, we actually do test this experimentally, and I don't, I'm not showing that here because it's kind of uh, a lot to get into right now. But we do this experiment and we uh, ask if these actually hold up, and they do using the per mutants. I mean, I can show you those figures later if we have some time, um, which is actually really cool. So, what we know is that the model is remarkably good for qualitative aspects. And if you make the S process and the C process codependent, then you have very good quantitative fits as well. Um, which actually brings us to this question that we were uh, talking about in the beginning. Does the clock network of Drosophila set the sleep, wake and uh, sleep and wake thresholds and how we can address this experimentally and how well this model holds for Drosophila sleep? Uh, and in the context of the nervous system, uh, we make certain predictions, which we are now in the process of testing. So the first thing that we really want to talk about is how you see this um, buildup of sleep pressure uh, when it hits the upper threshold is when sleep is initiated. And you will see that both these initiation uh, of sleep happen when um, these kind of, um, the, the sleep pressure actually hits the rising phase of the threshold, right? And you will see that the wake is initiated both also during the rising phase of the sleep threshold. But the maintenance of nighttime sleep actually happens because of the falling threshold, if that makes sense. So you see this, this sleep pressure uh, kind of falls and it hits the lower threshold when the lower threshold starts to increase, which means that this falling of the lower threshold is maintaining nighttime sleep, right? Now, um, so what we have here are um, color-coded neuronal classes in the brain, which have been previously characterized to be wake or sleep promoting. And what we have on the right here are uh, calcium activity of these neuronal classes. And when you kind of overlay them with the two process model, yeah, just to give, just to give you a little bit of background, that should represent when the neurons are firing and when they're silent. So when you get right. high calcium, that's a, that's a, that's an indication that neurons are firing. Yeah. And when you get low calcium, that's an indication that they're Quiet. So it's like, yeah, activity of the neurons. And the, and the blue is like one neuron and the green is a different or two kind of neuron. Yeah. One class of, one class of neurons. So, so the there's, 75, is, yeah. there's 75 neurons, but the classes consist of like one to 16. And they work together. We th well, we think, we think based on the work that I and others have done for about 20 years, that the, the, the sense of time emerges from this entire network. You need these neurons to talk to each other in order to get a really robust, reliable, near 24-hour uh, oscillation. Yeah. So each of these neuronal classes have kind of dispersed phases, mm -hmm. but their phase relationships are kind of fixed. And the 24-hour periodicity of is an emergent property of the network. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we think is happening is that the peak of activity of these so-called wake-promoting neurons works towards building up of the threshold. So it's the rising phase of the threshold that it regulates. And the activity of these sleep promoting neurons is probably working to push the threshold down. And that's what we think is going on. And these are now things that you can actually uh, experimentally manipulate and ask. So you can uh, inhibit specifically using genetic tools, you can inhibit the wake promoting and the sleep promoting neurons. And the advantage of this model now is you can make these predictions. And so this is basically a wild type condition that I've already shown you a few times. Now, when you inhibit the uh, LND or the wake promoting neurons, which basically would mean that the rising threshold doesn't happen, the model predicts that sleep rhythm, although there are some modest changes, will still continue to remain rhythmic. Interestingly, 
when you inhibit the sleep promoting neurons you see which means that there will be no fall in the thresholds sleep becomes arrhythmic there is no circadian rhythmicity in sleep anymore this is super counterintuitive because people have uh, not I, we are talking about homeostatically regulated sleep which is different from the standard 5 minute unitary definition of sleep and when people have looked at locomotor activity people have not seen this loss of rhythmicity when you inhibit or mess with the sleep promoting neurons but we think that when you look at specifically homeostatically regulated sleep which we can now um, that's something that we didn't talk about but we have made some advances in the lab by which we can look at just that sleep then these rhythms should now become circadian arrhythmic which i think if that holds up i think is going to be really really cool so that's basically uh, what we have with the model and i think Ori would like to kind of no, wrap I, it up i think that's a good place to start because i think we're you know, over time, time. If, if anybody okay. has questions i um, i think that's a good yeah and we also just summary quickly tell you that we can actually do all kinds of deprivation experiments in flies and also look at what happened to be this process tries in dk and stuff like that we can make predictions and we can test them basically that's the takeaway and yeah we that's the lab I think we have to um, acknowledge all the people who've put in the work and help do all of this. And of course, the ASRC and the funding agencies. Thank you. Thanks for the, thanks for the invitation. Yeah, th thank you. You know, I, I think it just for um, someone that really doesn't know any biology, I'm amazed that what you can control is like the C curves and you can you know you understand that that's a particular neuron firing and you can suppress that or yeah. and whereas like the s reaction which seems to be much more macroscopic it's some kind of a molecule is like the thing that you that is like the mystery well and i think brings up a really important point we because of how far the circadian field is we knew that we could manipulate c Right. I don't think that the sleep field is for, further far enough along that we could do the same kind of like logical manipulation of S because right. nobody knows what the hell it is yet. Exactly. I was like, it I was, seems like <laughs> such like just in terms of the size of the objects involved, it seems like well, an easier the problem. The circadian is the sun, right? and the, the S is our brain. So then you... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, actually, that's also something that we're doing in the lab now, trying to figure out what S is in the fly. Yeah, we, we're, we, we, we just got a grant to do this. We think we've got a we've got a unique way in that might actually allow us to find uh, the sleep substance in the fly brain. And then, then you could learn something about humans, maybe. After that. Once you have a molecule, uh, then you probably have a set of genes that govern that molecule, and then you can go look in human genetics and, and mouse genetics and see if there's any any relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, another question that I was thinking about when you were talking is like, you, you're getting something periodic, say, but if you run it over really long times, like, you know, 100,000 days, mm -hmm. does, does that persist or does it just vaporize? Ah, that's a good question. I So I have a feeling that these systems are fairly stable. So I haven't done 100,000 days, but at least up to about, in the simulations, up to about uh, 100 days or so, they're okay. Mm -hmm. um, experimentally, these rhythms last till you die. Like just before you die, these rhythms will kind of become, like you flies will, for example, lose rhythms and then they die. Yeah. So loss of this rhythmicity happens just before you're about to die. But right. circadian rhythms persist throughout. I mean, I, I guess I was thinking about it because uh, you, in your introduction, or you were talking about how there's these mechanisms for making adjustments, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then there's also this idea that maybe it doesn't have to go forever because the fly doesn't live that long. So. I was just wondering, like, is there an adjustment happening, or is it just that that it things become a periodic over? I think the longer. best the best evidence right now is that the circadian system continues to be extremely reliable, but it's probably process S that really changes. Um, that what you find is that in old people and in old animals, 
the your to our the best of our ability that cycling is still going but sleep becomes much more fragmented, fragmented. much less and my guess is that corresponds to these these F process s values jumping around and being i stable. also think with age the distance between the thresholds might also change which will give you fragmentation even if the s is the same so those kind of things see the other thing is we don't even know what these thresholds are so we don't know if that's what's causing these things <laughs> sure but we don't know we don't yeah okay fine. but <laughs> yeah so it's it's like that i also don't know if the distance between these thresholds um what kind of variation there is that also might be going up i mean there's so many things like that can mm -hmm. happen i think but Ori is right once we know which neurons do what to these thresholds i think we'll be in a better position to answer those questions and it looks like you have a guess and is that consistent with your I will experience tell uh, studying the studying the, the neurons. Uh, I will tell you that I have some preliminary evidence that suggests that this is true, which is really exciting. Which is really exciting. and I we really wouldn't have gone there had we not been facing everything on this you, you, monetary model. Uh, so we think inhibiting sleep promoting neurons is causing disruption of sleep, which is not so much which is not so much of a surprise. Well, but it is to the field because as right. as, as Abalash mentioned what. When most people study time series of behavior, they, they study activity alpha. They study bean crossing or wheel running or movement. And, and when all the work that was done by people like me who had no theoretical basis of just saying, okay, let's, let's kill these neurons or let's silence these neurons and see which of these neurons is most important for those rhythms that we measure with just bean crossing data. Those DNs are not important at all. But now that we've got a handle on what's probably really pros SS, he didn't go into why we think we've got a better handle on this now, but now that we're really focused on homeostatically controlled sleep, it really looks like our model suggests that those DNs, which are not important for just simple beam crossing rhythms, are really important for consolidated homeostatically controlled sleep, which is just mind blowing. So right. Really predicted that. I mean, I just uh, to give you a brief thing. So these relationships are based on the five minute definition of inactivity definition of sleep, right? Which I told you. But what I did was I uh, changed that definition and I made, instead of five minutes, I made it 10 and 15. And so what we do see is when you get rid of these shorter episodes of sleep all the way up to about 30 minutes or so, these relationships don't, don't change, which means that uh, homeostatically, and because the model is only talking about homeostatically regulated sleep, we think that these longer bouts of inactivity are truly reflecting homeostatic sleep, which is what we do when we kind of analyze this data. And we see that if you do the standard five minute unitary definition, uh, you don't see these patterns, but when you kind of just bias your analysis to kind of longer. And it's, it's long past the time when this unitary yes or no definition of sleep implies is, is, is untenable because we know human sleep has different stages. You, know, you talk about, just REM sleep and non-REM sleep. And then within non-REM sleep, you've got stage one, stage two, stage three. And when you look at those stages, some of those stages are clearly much more strongly controlled by the homeostasis. Stage three, deep non-REM sleep pretty much explains all of Bourbet's two process model. And so that's restorative sleep. That's, that's the sleep that the homeostat. And what basically what the lab has shown at the ASRC over the last year is that there's a deeper, longer bout of sleep in flies. And Abalash just did a, a series of plots where you can see the fly cycling through those different stages of sleep, just like humans. Uh, and so by focusing on what we really think is a clear reflection of process S, we're getting much more reasonable and interesting results yeah. that the rest of the field's not getting. I think we're really at like an important, exciting place. Yeah. You know? okay. The field's fighting us tooth and nail on it, though. That's <laughs> yeah. really why. That's well, there's <laughs> several things. The main thing is, so there's another wing of the lab that's studying sleep homeostasis. And, you know, you have to be able to deprive an animal to see rebound. And the way that flies have been deprived of sleep is to physically shake the flies every 20 seconds. Yeah, I mean, it's for crazy. hours. <laughs> and, then, and then you're like, okay, we've got a set of flies that have been abused for 12 hours and a, a set of flies that have been completely left alone for 24 hours and any differences that you find between those sets of flies is explained by sleep pressure which is horseshit it's like trauma yeah. it is and more it, likely it, to be trauma german undergrads that started us out it's like 
yeah, we maybe we should be careful also assigning the you know, you put someone in a bunker underground and you stick a thermometer up their bum, maybe <laughs> <laughs> could have an effect. Exactly. Now now imagine, imagine though that every 20 seconds that whole bunker was violently shaken, like what you know what I mean? And that's what the that's, flies are doing. That's that was my undergrad experience. <laughs> um, but we've we've found a way to actually control for that now, where you actually have two sets of flies that have experienced the same Super set market. of physical abuse, one of which has been chronically sleep deprived, and the other one is actually allowed, has been allowed to sneak in sleep, and everything changes. And so basically you've got people in the field that have spent 20 years studying sleep homeostasis and flies and have never answered to that confound. I mean, basically who are really pissed off at us for showing that well, actually most of most of the difference you see here is due to the fact that you've been vortexing your flies every 20 seconds for, for 12 hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's more like chasing an artifact, you know, rather than the actual phenomenon, which is problematic. We're not and, making any friends. Yeah. 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 Which is problematic and kind That's of difficult, true. but yeah. <laughs> we just got completely unreasonably slaughtered at a journal because these because they're just very, very reactionary. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the game. 10 years from now. <laughs> I knew that to be reactionary to the people who come after you. So. Well, yeah, you, I mean, that's the I, choice, right? I, I, <laughs> I, I know, I know once I applied for an NSF grant in the, in the pathology uh, the department and one of the referees rejected it because he said, I didn't talk about C star algebra. It was kind of like, <laughs> With my proposal has nothing, nothing to do with it. <laughs> yeah, why didn't she write the proposal that I would have written? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, all right, I'm going to stop recording. And, uh, do you have any sense of like, uh, I mean, I'm assuming these analysis you of that, the, whether you, for certain parameter values, you get periodic behavior. Because mm -hmm. uh, to me, this yeah, looks like a so kind right. of failure system. I don't know if you're familiar with like, like oh, You just take that domain and you run. Start running a particle motion and typically reflect its cross mm -hmm. and you just look at it in long term dynamics. But, um, and often there will be chaotic.